Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Welcome back, everyone. Great to have you here today on episode 2216 of the Cabral Concept. All links today will be at stephencabral.com forward slash 2216. And we are going to be going over the brain fog and gut bacteria connection. This is extremely important because there's some really great science out there. And then there's also some misinterpreted science that I want to go over with you here today. So we're going to start off by simply saying, you know, what is brain fog for those people that don't know? Brain fog is honestly debilitating. And if you've never experienced it before, I applaud you and I think that you are very, very fortunate because for those people that have dealt with it before, they basically feel like a walking zombie that they think can't think clearly. It's not the same as just forgetting your keys or not remembering where you park. That That's not brain fog necessarily. Brain fog is literally feel like you're thinking in slow motion, that you're in a bit of a haze and it oftentimes correlates and corresponds with lower energy overall. So brain fog is is like living in a fog. That's what it feels like. It just takes you a while to process what you're reading, what someone's saying to you. You feel groggy overall, and it oftentimes uh, correlates or, or, again, corresponds with other conditions such as low mood, low energy, low libido, low drive, low ambition, like all of those things. They kind of all go together. And that's because brain fog has a root cause. Lo and behold, you know, look at that. Brain fog, just like everything else, has a root cause. So just because, again, your medical doctor tells you that there's no uh, understanding of it, that there's no root cause, and, um, you know, there's nothing they can do, well, there is. Everything has a root cause. The root cause that I've seen in my practice 25 years now well over a quarter of a million uh, client appointments that we've seen in my team is that brain fog most usually occurs with a few different specific imbalances. And I want to give you those here today, but then I also want to share with you why there was a new study linking probiotics to potentially causing brain fog in some people. So What happens is many people are suffering from inflammatory-based imbalances, okay? So that inflammation can also cause brain fog as well. But as you know, if you've been listening to this show for a while, uh, inflammation is not the root cause of any disease. It is a causal factor in the dis-ease, but inflammation has a root cause. So what might be the root cause of the inflammation? Well, for many people, it's a lack of cortisol production. So they wake up in the morning, and if they've ever run a stress hormones mood and metabolism test, you can find that lab at stephencabral.com forward slash labs. You can run it right at home. And if your cortisol is below a six, most people are going to feel like they haven't woken up, that they're going to feel groggy, that they're going to feel low energy, low mood, all the lows. And that's because literally they haven't. The way that you wake up, is by producing more cortisol, especially between the hours of 6 and 8 a.m. Really important. So cortisol is one factor. The other factor is thyroid. Just like cortisol is produced at a peak between 6 and 8 a.m., kind of tells you maybe when you're awake should be, thyroid begins to get produced at its peak around 3 to 4 a.m., and that is because then it affects cortisol. They work hand in hand. Thyroid and cortisol are, are basically siblings. I mean, they're, they're related. Uh, sometimes they get in arguments. Sometimes they get in fights. Cortisol usually wins. When cortisol wins, what happens? It begins to slow thyroid. I have many podcasts on that as well. But thyroid, if people have low thyroid, and again, we're talking a TSH above a 2.5. If you have low thyroid or usable thyroid, which is typically T3, free T3, you're going to have poor circulation. You're going to have um, 
poor blood flow. So to the hands, feet, the extremities that include feet, that includes the brain as well. And uh, lower metabolic rate. And that will absolutely affect brain fog too. Another one that goes along with both of these hormones is neurotransmitters. Norepinephrine that you could consider a stress hormone is a neurotransmitter. And that is what gets us into fight or flight. Now, again, fight or flight is, it can go too far, but the sympathetic nervous system needs norepinephrine. And that, again, gets us woken up for the day, right? We're ready. We're ready to start our day. Norepinephrine has a big part of that. So does dopamine. So what we want to look at, are, we, are any of these off? And so you can test those. Again, a stress hormones, mood and metabolism test. And if those look good, then you want to test your neurotransmitters as well. The excitatory neurotransmitters, you don't want to overdo them or they shouldn't be imbalanced uh, as well, but you want to have enough dopamine and norepinephrine. Really, really important. And then the balancing ones are the GABA and serotonin. There are others as well, but those are the main four that we look at. And um, after this, if all of those are good, another thing that could cause brain fog are food sensitivities. So food sensitivities is a big one. If you eat a food and it causes a histamine production or cytokine production in any way, that can cause inflammation and that can absolutely lead to brain fog. So if your brain fog comes within an hour or so of eating a meal, it was probably the food at that meal. That, that's a definite possibility. Now, if it comes the next day after food sensitivity, we call that an IgG food sensitivity. And uh, you can test those levels, again, at stephencabral.com forward slash labs and just look for the food sensitivity test. You don't need to run them through my practice, but you can at least know what those labs are. And then you can work with your local naturopathic doctor or integrative health practitioner. Okay. Uh, there is one, well, there's, there's other possibilities for brain fog, right? Heavy metals, viral load, um, anything that causes inflammation in the body. All right. So there's other reasons overtraining the next, like if you over exercise the next day, you might have brain fog. So there's always inflammation, right? What caused it? That's what we have to find. But there's another big one that we see in our practice because hormones might be okay. Cortisol, neurotransmitters, uh, might, might all be okay. What we find, though, are people with yeast overgrowth or bacterial overgrowth, something sometimes called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, often have brain fog. Now, they typically then have sometimes rosacea or skin rashes or low thyroid, other issues too, but it can stem from the gut. And I, and I want to share with you why. Because there are certain bacteria in your gut that actually produce... Uh, what we refer to in, in health as metabolic acidosis. So it can actually increase overall inflammation, right? So when these bacteria or yeast begin to ferment food inside of your gut, you can begin to get brain fog. It's one of the reasons why people go on a keto diet or carnivore diet and begin to feel better. Again, that is a conventional medicine band-aid-based diet to relieve symptoms. But I understand people want to relieve symptoms, but a practitioner shouldn't be recommending that because all you're doing is shrinking your gut microbiome, not feeding those yeast or bacteria, and you're just pretending like it'll just go away on its own. That's not what happens, right? Everybody who does a keto diet or carnivore diet eventually stops. Uh, everybody. And even the biggest proponents, they all eat carbs now too, right? So we know that that's not going to work. So what we need to do is say, okay, well, what's going on? Oh, there's an overgrowth of yeast. There's an overgrowth of more pathogenic-based bacteria. How do you find this out? You can run a candida metabolic and vitamins test, or and or you can do both, uh, which I would recommend, is running the bacteria and parasite stool test, right? So then you look for what's called uh, positive bacteria, I mean, good bacteria, commensal bacteria, basically neutral, and then pathogenic bacteria, which is bacteria that you don't want overgrown. And when you look at these and you find these, you can then say, oh, this is why I have additional brain fog, especially when eating more carbohydrates or carbs in general, even from fruit sometimes. And so again, this is all in the literature. It's showing that a lot of this you know, can produce delactate. It can lead to more of what's called, um, and like I said, metabolic acidosis. Uh, it can create more inflammation in the gut. It can create slower bowel transit time, leading to more uh, fermentation and, again, more bloating, gas, et cetera. So if you have bloating and gas and you have brain fog, it's almost always, like 9 out of 10 times, related to gut function. So uh, although I'm sharing on the topic of brain fog today, I want you to know that there are no silver bullets in natural health. Meaning like, oh, take this one thing and you'll be better tomorrow. That's not what natural health does. Natural health is about finding the root cause, rebalancing your body, 
from a fundamental and foundational underlying root cause issue. But the nice thing is when you fix that, you don't just fix the brain fog. You get your energy back. You get your mood back, right? You get your ambition and drive and libido all back. You get your endurance back. You stabilize hormones. And that's because, especially with digestion, well, that's the epicenter where you're digesting all the digesting all the nutrients that you need for your body. That's how your body runs. Vitamins, minerals, amino acids, fatty acids, glucose molecules, right? This is how our body runs. So this is extremely important. All right, let me now bring it full circle. So if we know that if the gut is imbalanced, it can cause brain fog, and we know that probiotics can help to rebalance the gut, what went wrong? Well, I'm going to show you what went wrong in this study. So this study, and I'm going to link it up for you as well, because again, I want to just show both sides to this. So this is uh, called brain fogginess, gas, and bloating, a link between SIBO, probiotics, and metabolic acidosis. Clinical and translational gastroenterology, and, um, and again, I'll link all that up. So basically, it was saying that brain fog is caused by probiotics, and that probiotics can cause small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, it, which, by the way, is almost entirely false. Like everything about that statement is entirely false. So then you say, well, how can that be? This is a scientific study. Okay, well, so the thing is, most people, and I totally get it, everyone's busy, or again, like most people don't know how to read research papers, which I wouldn't expect them to, right? I don't know how to do uh, tax accounting. I don't know how to do open heart surgery. Like they, they, these things are not necessarily taught, but they're very important because when you look at the study, this is what I wanted to share with you. So we had people using yogurt daily or cultured yogurt daily. Now, why is this an issue? Well, those are different than probiotics. We're talking about when you take cultured um, yogurt, if, you, if it's homemade, it could have trillions of probiotics. We're not talking about 50 billion. We're talking about trillions. That's one. The second is that it's yogurt. The number one food sensitivity in the world is cow's milk dairy. Okay, so just that's one reason. So we've got one that could be an issue with bloating, gas, fermentation. Literally, lactose and a lot of these things cause fermentation. All right. What is the second potential issue in the study? Again, these are just potential issues. Opioid use. 23% of the, so 36% of the people were using dairy in their diet. 23% were using opioids. Well, again, this is why it's very dangerous when a scientist has knowledge in only one area, but the, yet they're making broad spectrum correlations. Okay. Opi opioid use can slow or speed up bowel transit time. It could make the bowels more sluggish. If it makes the bowels more sluggish, there's slower bowel transit time, which means the stool and food stay in one place longer instead of moving through the digestive tract, which should happen over a course of about 12 hours to 24 hours to make it to the colon. It's going to stay there for a bit and then leave the body. From the food in the mouth, to out in the bowel movement is typically 24 hours to 36 hours. Stomach, it's there for one to three hours, depending on the size of the meal. Could be there longer if it's hard to digest. And then it starts to move through the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, mixes with enzymes, bile, et cetera. Then the jejunum, nutrients are absorbed, makes its way to the ileum, which is the last part of the small intestine. Uh, and then by then, all the nutrients are pretty much done. There are B vitamins made there, though. Very, very important. And then it moves through the ileocecal valve and the cecum. Okay. This study, by the way, <clears throat> excuse me, didn't even talk about how opioids could affect the ileocecal valve. I've talked about the ileocecal valve before. If it stays open, your colon bacteria literally starts to backfill into your small intestine. Not good. But again, they never talk about that in conventional medicine. But here's the wild thing. We've got 36 people, 36% of people plus using dairy, 23% using opioids, and 43% using proton pump inhibitors, PPIs, which means they're not making stomach acid. Guess what? If you're using acid blockers, you give a free ride for bacteria and parasites in your food to go right into your small intestine because it's the acid that's supposed to kill those things and neutralize them before it ever makes it to your small intestine. A lot of people are worried about PPIs uh, not allowing you to absorb calcium, magnesium, zinc, B12, and other nutrients, and they're right. But the real issue, the real issue is the pathogens it lets in, which is bacteria and parasites. So, as I said, this study 
was not done by someone that is really under, has a real understanding of the gut. And again, I don't know who did the study. I'm not talking negatively about them, but this make you can't make correlations and, and, and have a study like this. And the other is that it's observational, uh, right? We're not, we're not like going in depth and looking at it. But again, what I do want to say is that all of this is still correct. Meaning like their study is still correct. Their conclusions are false. And the reason is that these people are giving free rides to their intestines, 43% of them, almost half, by using a proton pump inhibitor. So they're stopping stomach acid. Then almost a quarter are using opioids, which could affect the ileocecal valve, bowel transit time, et cetera. Then we've got 36.7% taken in dairy on a daily basis. So all of those things can lead to what? Bacterial overgrowth in the intestines. The same exact thing that they were testing for. So I would be careful with that. Now, but I am saying that bacteria can cause brain fog. So I'm in agreement. If you have bacterial overgrowth or SIBO in your intestines, it could absolutely be causing your brain fog. So as I bring this full circle, the number one thing that you could do is if you only ran one lab, if you have gas and you have bloating or any digestive issues, if you can only run one lab, it's the bacteria and parasite stool test. If you're unwilling to do a stool test, the second best lab to run is the candida metabolic and vitamins test. Okay, that's the second. In that, that one is a huge test and it gives you so much information. But if you're looking for bacteria, it's not as good as the bacteria and parasite stool test. If you can run both plus a food sensitivity, okay, now that's the gold standard. If you can do all three of those, definitely recommend it. There are bundles that are available to run all three at once. Uh, you can find those at stephencabral.com forward slash labs. What this does is it gets to the underlying root cause of what's actually going on there, right? Why the brain fog? Well, the brain fog actually is stemming from something else. Remember, you don't need to run them through my practice. You can always run them locally if you choose to with a integrative health practitioner or naturopathic doctor that specializes in the gut, right? They have to know how to then clean up the gut. I can't go through how to clean up the gut today, but I gave you the lab test. And if you want to know exactly what we do to clean up the gut, you can check out my podcast on the CBO protocol, CBO protocol. And I detail that every single step of it so that practitioners can use it as well as everyday people. And I will link that up for you today along with the study at stephencabral.com forward slash 2216. stephencabral.com forward slash 2216. Hopefully today's show was helpful. Uh, please do feel free to let me know what you thought in the comments. And I'm always happy to help if you have any questions. Take care, everyone. Did you know that the body really only becomes sick or unbalanced in only two ways? Over time, you become deficient in vital nutrients and you also accumulate toxins internally and from the environment. As those nutrients diminish and you increase your total toxic load, your body then begins to show the first signs of dis-ease. It's actually quite predictable and the good news is that if we know how you began to fill up that proverbial rain barrel, we also know how to empty it to begin the healing process. I was fortunate enough to learn this ancient healing process from my mentor after suffering from debilitating diseases for close to a decade. It was only when I began to implement these techniques did I finally overcome my illnesses and go on to live a life of energy and vitality that I now enjoy. I'd like to share with you now what I discovered after traveling all over the world and how to combine the best of ancient healing wisdom with state-of-the-art science. Allow me to teach you exactly how I've been able to help over a quarter of a million people to empty their rain barrel and begin to transform their body and lives into what they've always hoped they could be. To get your copy of the international bestseller, The Rain Barrel Effect, simply go to stephencabral.com forward slash rain barrel.